Welcome. My name is Pippa Norris, and I'd like to introduce you to a new report which is released from the Electoral Integrity Project on the year in elections 2014. The project is based at the University of Harvard and Sydney Universities, and the report is produced by myself, by Fran Martinez Ikoma, and by Max Grompy. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information about the project, and then to talk about the evidence. How do we know when elections meet international standards of electoral integrity and where they fail? I'll present some of the results, how we diagnose problems around the world, and think about some of the best and the worst elections which occurred according to our evidence in 2014 and then turn to questions about how do we start to explain why some countries and some elections rank much higher than others, and focusing on three issues in particular, patterns of democracy, patterns of economic development, and the role of political institutions. Then I'll outline some further research and information sources, and how to contact us. So first, what's the Electoral Integrity Project about? It's an independent project, set up as a scholarly research project, which is based in Harvard and Sydney, and it's primarily funded by the Australian Research Council, although other sponsors and other foundations have also contributed towards our work. I'm the director of the project. Fern Martinez Ikoma is the program manager for the Perception of Electoral Integrity Survey, and Max Grumping is the research assistant and a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. In addition, we have the advice of a wide range of international experts who are on our advisory board. And this includes those who are working in the international community, as well as those who are based in universities in different places around the world. Now, when we talk about electoral integrity, it's a new concept. So what do we mean? For the project, electoral integrity refers to international standards and global norms. That's to say, the ways and the principles which govern the appropriate conduct of elections. As such, it's a normative concept, it's about evaluations, but it also is one that can be turned into empirical indicators to use good evidence to evaluate elections. The standards are endorsed by the world's governments in a series of authoritative written conventions, treaties, and international laws. So electoral integrity for us is not rooted per se in democratic theory or the writing of any particular theorist. Instead, it's based on what the world has agreed to be those standards. And it's emphasized that the standards aren't simply ones which apply to developing countries or to new democracies, Instead, they're applying universally to all countries which have endorsed these international laws. So issues, for example, of free and fair elections, of inclusive processes of voter registering, registration, or of equitable access to campaign funding are as appropriate for countries like Germany and Sweden as they are for countries like Zimbabwe or Syria. We can also break it down by thinking of the different stages in an election. Often when we think about problems, attention focuses on the final stages. So the media, for example, draw attention to issues such as ballot stuffing of, at the ballot box, or issues of voter fraud or impersonation. But in fact, elections can go wrong at any stage in the cycle. So it could be a problem of election laws, which might restrict certain parties from being able to stand, or procedures, or how countries Think about uh, designing their boundaries if they divide up their districts, for example, if they have partisan gerrymandering. There could be a problem of voter registration if certain groups of the population are not enfranchised or excluded, for example, refugees who are abroad. It could be a problem of party and candidate registration if some kind of candidates are disqualified. There can be a, a major problem of campaign media and money if all parties and all candidates don't have equitable access. The voting process can be ineffective or can go wrong for technological reasons. The vote count needs to be transparent and accurate and honest. 
the results need to be announced in a timely fashion, and the EMB, electoral management body, needs to have the capacity and resources to run elections effectively. So any one stage can break the link and therefore cause fundamental problems in that particular contest. What's our evidence to try to measure these broad concepts? Well, there are many sources of evidence that could be used. For example, international monitor reports observe each election. The problem is that different organizations and agencies can come to different conclusions. Similarly, we can use media reports when reporters talk about a particular campaign. But again, there can be problems of consistency and the news headlines often focus on problems rather than those elections which succeed. So how do we know when elections are deeply flawed or when they fail? So we turn to the Perception of Electoral Integrity Index, and it's an expert survey which is used as a method in many other different types of ways of collecting information, for example, about problems of corruption or about issues of good governance. We have a comprehensive approach. We compare all presidential and parliamentary elections around the world, except for microstates, which are defined as a dozen countries which have a population below about 100,000. The current release of the data set, which is the third release, covers now cumulatively 127 elections in 107 countries in the period since it started in the 1st of July 2012 to the 31st of December 2014. And it's a rolling survey, so it will continue next year and in years to come. And in each case, this expands the coverage as countries hold national elections. We collect evaluations from many different types of election experts, particularly domestic and international experts. And this survey, this wave, includes 1,429 experts to create the evidence. And to collect their views, we use an instrument, a questionnaire, which monitors 49 separate indicators, which can be broken down into 11 stages in the electoral cycle. And these can be aggregated into an overall perception of electoral integrity index, which is standardized to 100 points for ease of comparison. These are the sort of questions that you use. So experts are asked, in the presidential or parliamentary on a particular date in your country, do you agree or disagree on a five-point scale with the following items? For example, on electoral laws, were the electoral laws uh, unfair to smaller parties? On procedures, were elections well managed? Or on voter registration, uh, the electoral register was inaccurate? So we try to measure all the different aspects throughout the electoral cycle including both positive and negative items, and that gives us our measures that we can then collect and present. So what does the evidence show from the source? How do we start to diagnose problems in countries around the world? Here's the world map, and you can see immediately that there are some countries and some elections which the experts regard very highly in electoral integrity. So countries such as Norway and Sweden fall into that category, along with parts of Northern Europe. Other countries, the experts say, have elections which are only moderate in electoral integrity, and that includes some long-standing democracies such as India, which has problems of violence and political finance, as well as the case of the United States and Mexico. So despite the fact that the United States is one of the longest-standing democracies around the world, Experts felt that there were some clear weaknesses in the procedures used for elections, such as electoral laws and voter registration processes. And some countries are those which we've red flagged as having more fundamental problems. And you can immediately see that there are certain cases, like Syria, which fall into that category. And these are ones which the experts thought were very critical in how they conducted their elections. There are also some countries which don't have any national elections in their constitutions, and that includes, for example, uh, China at national level, as well as Saudi Arabia. And then there are some countries which 
have elections, but which are not um, in, in their constitutions, but which are not yet implemented, for example, in unstable states such as Somalia. And in a range of other countries, they haven't yet held a national election in the time period since we started the survey, but they will be included in future waves as we move through. So what's the overall rankings? Well, the report and the website give more details, but here for a snapshot, we can just contrast those elections that were seen as the best elections, according to the experts in 2014, and those which are highlighted as the worst. So the best elections include countries like Lithuania, which was ranked number one, Costa Rica, Sweden, Slovenia, and Uruguay. And what immediately jumps out is that whilst countries which are long-standing democracies and most affluent countries like Sweden do, uh, do rank, are ranked very highly, nevertheless, some new democracies and emerging economies are also in this category. So Lithuania and Slovenia, which only became more democratic after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union, have now got elections which are ranked amongst some of the best in the world. Costa Rica and Uruguay, similarly. By contrast, however, there are also contests which have been held, which are deeply flawed. This includes, in our experts' estimations, elections in Egypt, for example, the presidential election, which brought about um, uh, the uh, return of, of uh, General Sisi, but which was flawed in particular because many of the supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood have been repressed or imprisoned, and the parties have been restricted in being able to stand for that election. Mozambique, where again there was conflict and the opposition boycotted some of the results. Afghanistan, where in the final round, the two major candidates were in a close fought race, but one of the candidates alleged fraud on an industrial scale. There, there was an audit of all 8 million votes conducted by the United Nations. In the end of the day, only a brokered agreement caused the election result um, to, to have any fruition in government. Bahrain, where again there was a major sectarian conflict and the opposition parties boycotted the election. And Syria, which held an election in the midst of a civil war, where only those areas which are held by the government could vote, rebel areas could not have ballot stations, and more than nine million uh, people who are refugees outside of its borders were also not allowed to vote if they didn't have um, a visa stamp. So these are elections which are deeply flawed uh, when our experts examined how they'd worked. Again, let's break this down by region and look a little further at all the different stages. And what this shows is that if we start to compare regions, Campaign finance is not simply a problem in, say, developing countries or in countries with corruption. Instead, it's a problem which is quite endemic throughout most regions of the world. Media coverage, similarly, is seen as problematic in many parts of the world. By contrast, however, certain issues are more based in, for example, the Middle East or Western Central Africa, scoring much lower on things such as the vote count or the results stage or the role of electoral authorities. This highlights how media coverage and campaign finance are major issues that need to be addressed by the international community. And it's most striking that these are also areas where conventions which have been developed, whilst they do protect, for example, freedom of the press and human rights, are still not very effective, for example, in regulating equitable access to political resources during an election. So what explains levels of electoral integrity, and those cases which succeed and those which fail. There are three general patterns which we emphasize in our report, democracy, development, and political institutions. But it's worth emphasizing that these are general patterns and there are often exceptions to each of these. So what we find when we do our analysis is that contemporary levels of democratization and the contemporary and historical stock of democracy are both important factors. In many ways, that's not surprising. After all, when we try to measure democracy, we often include elections as a central component. But it's worth emphasizing that 
the stock of democracy, which is representing of the average levels of democracy throughout the third wave era from the early 70s to date, is a strong predictor. Economic development is a second factor, which is also important. But here what's interesting is that it's not a linear trend. Instead, there's a step shift, meaning that as countries become more affluent, it doesn't mean to say that their elections continue to improve. Instead, once an election, sorry, once a country reaches a certain level of affluence, in particular we estimate around 15,000 per capita GDP, then we have elections which tend to meet levels of electoral integrity. And lastly, power sharing institutions are also critical. So where there are countries with a free and independent press and effective and independent parliaments, then they're more likely to have watchdogs which can check malpractices and in particular check the abuse of power. So here's some of the evidence. And this shows us firstly just how the perception of electoral integrity index compares with patterns of contemporary levels of democratization measured by both Freedom House and by Polity. And you can see that on average, there's a strong relationship, but even within each category of different types of democracy or autocracy, there's variations. So for example, amongst the democracies, it's clear that elections in Norway and Costa Rica and Germany were ranked more strongly, according to our experts, than others such as Japan or Barbados or Ghana. If we look at the stock of democracy, that's the historical level accumulated over the last period since 1972, again we find a strong relationship, but again variations. So if we look in this case at countries which have hardly moved in their levels of autocracy at the bottom of the rank, what we find is that some countries have more effective elections than others. So, for example, Equatorial Guinea, Syria and Tajikistan are rated very badly compared with Bosnia-Herzegovina or Bhutan or Rwanda. And this illustrates some of those contrasts. So you can see again the contrast between democracies and autocracies 21 points on average, but there's a greater gap in terms of electoral procedures and electoral laws and party and candidates registration. Those are the areas where autocracies uh, need to consider major reforms. Economic development. This shows the pattern when we compare the index of electoral integrity against per capita GDP and we can see that some of the affluent countries um, do work very well, including, for example, Norway. But the level of electoral integrity in Norway is fairly comparable to that in the Czech Republic or that in Costa Rica. And amongst the poorer countries, we can see again that there's quite a lot of variation. So countries such as Afghanistan, Zimbabwe at the bottom are some of the lowest in per capita income. And countries which do better but are still poor include those such as Mongolia and Namibia, according to our experts. Press freedom. We can illustrate this as one of the ways in which we can think about political institutions. And what's important here is that the, the stronger the role of independent media, the more effectively they can um, act as an agency for transparency, calling attention to any problems which occur during the election. So we can see a strong relationship here between levels of press freedom measured by Reporters Without Borders and the PEI index. So this is some of our work, but we have other reports where we can also provide further research and information. And this highlights some of our books, Why Electoral Integrity Matters with Cambridge University Press, which illustrates some of these issues, and in particular, when elections fail, what difference does it make for patterns of political attitudes, such as confidence and trust in political institutions, for political participation, such as voting turnout and protest, and for regime stability? The second book, Advancing Electoral Integrity, is an edited collection which brought together an international range of scholars and experts to discuss some of the issues facing elections. And our book on contentious elections is also edited with Routledge University Press, 
And this book looks in particular at the problems of conflict and protest and what happens when there's violence at the polls. If you want further information, you can find it at the Electoral Integrity website. And in particular, you can find information about our workshops and events, about other publications and research papers, and about opportunities for fellowship and research with our project. In addition, you'd be very welcome if you would like further information to contact myself, Pippa Norris, or Ferran, or Max, and we'll be very happy to answer your questions about any matters of detail. You can also download the complete data set for your own analysis. If you go to the website, you can see how to do that. And it's available at the level of elections, as well as at country level, and at the individual expert level. So we like to share our data so that scholars, practitioners, policymakers, and reformers can all have access to everything that we do and can use it to analyze particular countries or particular problems. So thank you very much. I hope that this has proved uh, a useful overview. By all means, download the complete report, which is 49 pages, which is available at www.electrointegrityproject.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>